Hey, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, PSC 201 American Government, whatever time you're consuming this little bit of educational media. Uh, this is, again, uh, Vic McInnes, your American Government Instructor, live on tape from the COVID-19 compound here in lovely Grovetown, Georgia, uh, here in the Aiken Tech Outpost in Columbia County, coming to you live on tape from the Russell Athletic Conference Room, Russell Athletic. The sweatpant choice of all online instructors. Hey, listen, uh, today we're going to Chapter 12, Political Parties. It's going to be a two-part lecture. We're going to start today talking really about the history and how the political parties in the United States developed. Then uh, later on in the week, uh, depending on my connectivity and and, and everything else that's going on, uh, we'll be discussing uh, uh, how political parties work. Okay, so the first thing I want you to do is I want you to go to the Blackboard section of, uh, and look at the documents page. You will see Chapter 12, uh, Part 1 as a PDF, uh, and you can go ahead and open that. Again, these are all pretty big files because they're keynotes. Uh, so go ahead and open that. While you're doing that, we'll take a break. I will open my beverage. My beverage today is Diet Coke. Okay, um, so while you're doing that, let's just have a little talk about current events. Those of y'all heard last week that President Trump had decided that he was going to reopen the government on Easter, which is coming up in about a week and a half, uh, and the governors of the various states just sort of went, yeah, we're not going to play with that. Uh, and it wasn't just Democratic governors or Republican governors. Uh, Governor DeSantos down in Florida, who's a very strong Trump supporter, uh, and again, some that haven't exactly been great friends with President Trump, uh, sort of, uh, you know, like... Uh, 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 the governors of Washington, Michigan, and New York all sort of pushed back on, on President Trump and said, yeah, we don't think that's going to work for us. Now, that's all we all know why that can happen, and it's not the elastic clause. It's federalism. Because the federal government really doesn't control how states do uh, quarantines. That's all left up to the state. So uh, we all know that that's possible because of federalism. And President Trump's Article 2 powers do not give him the authority to override that. So when you're having a conversation around the dinner table tonight to discuss uh, what President Trump is doing and how he's handling things, uh, just uh, have everybody keep that in mind. So, all right, everybody should have the PDF up now. If you don't, I'm going to uh, give you a short break to hit pause. And then we'll come back and we'll move on through the uh, slides. Okay, so let's jump in. Title slide, political parties. You're seeing there, uh, that is actually, I uh, believe, uh, the 19, uh, the 2000 uh, Republican uh, Convention. I picked this slide because it's, it's absolutely impossible to see uh, who it is, but all political conventions look relatively the same. There's always a lot of balloons, red, white, and blue. You know, it's a, it's a political pep rally. So we're, we're talking today about political parties. So let's go to the next slide, which says all mature democratic democracies eventually develop uh, political parties. This is a basic truism. Uh, any national government that is going to be large enough and robust enough to govern an entire nation is going to wind up developing political parties. Uh, if we go sort of clockwise, starting with the upper right-hand corner, uh, the gentleman there in the, in the white shirt is running for prime minister in Thailand. If you go to the uh, to the bottom right corner uh, with the uh, yellow, red, and green flags, that's a, a political uh, party rally in Bolivia. If you go to the other corner in the lower left, that's South Korea. If you go up above that, immediately below the text, the uh, young lady with the flowers, that is in, in an Indian a political party rally. And then the one in the middle is in Mali. So political parties are a natural outgrowth outgrowth of a maturing democracy. It's part and parcel of what goes on. There's nothing inherently evil. A lot of people will say that political parties are the root of all evil. They're not. They're a natural outgrowth of the democratic process. In a national government, you're naturally going to have people centralized into different camps which become political parties. We're going to discuss how that happened here in the United States uh, in just a second. One thing, go to the next slide. The one thing you need to remember as we go through this lecture and as we sort of, you know, we're focusing on American political parties. Uh, I'm going to talk in American government. I'm going to talk in a minute about 
uh, uh, the British system, but really uh, it's just uh, we are kind of unique. So I'm not going to delve a great deal into multi-party systems because that doesn't really apply here. We have right now two parties. We've always had two parties. Uh, two primary parties, yes, there are some independents. Yes, there are other political parties like the Socialists, the Greens, uh, the Communist Party of the United States. The, the Prohibition Party is still around, and the Prohibition Party, after they kind of lost on Prohibition, became a white reactionary party in the South. They're still around. They ran a lot of Klansmen for offices. But basically, we have a two-party system, Republicans and Democrats, uh, and that makes us really unique in the world. We no, Nobody else really has that. So go to the next slide. First thing we need to do is look at what a political party is. And I like the Collins English Language Dictionary definition. A political party is an organization of people who share the same views about the way power should be used in a country or society through government, policymaking, and etc. Uh, political parties consist of three parts. First of all, there's the organization of the party itself with your state committees, with your national committees, with your local uh, ward uh, organizers. Then there's the label or, or the brand. To say you're a Democrat, to say you're a Republican, to say you're a member of the Communist Party, all imply certain things. And there are millions upon millions of people in the United States that, and, and they're not bad people, but they are going to vote for the Democratic Party. Used to, or the Republican Party, used to be we had in the South people that were called yellow dog Democrats because they would vote for a yellow dog if it ran on uh, the Democratic ticket. And then finally, there are the leaders of the party. Uh, people like Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, uh, uh, Mitch McConnell, uh, Donald Trump, people who are the focal point of party activity. Uh, and those are the three key elements of a political party. Anywhere in the world, a political party is going to have those three parts associated with it. Uh, by the way, that vote Whig uh, emblem there is from the current Whig party. The Whig party is trying to reassert itself. We're going to talk about the Whigs in a minute. Uh, but I like their slogan, vote Whig. We can't be any worse. So uh, if you go to the next slide, it'll say political parties in other countries. Uh, in most cases, compared to the United States, political parties in other countries are kind of weak. And it's going to sound kind of oxymoronish to begin with. Uh, oxymoron, word for the day, look it up. Um, other countries, parties control access to the ballot. Like if you're uh, living in the United Kingdom, or in this case, the, the picture here is Narendra Modi. He is the Prime Minister of India. If you live in India, the part, you don't get to select who goes on the ballot. The party committee for your uh, constituency or your district will decide who's going to run from your district. And in most places, they don't even have to live in the district to be run by the district. So uh, uh, in the United States, it's completely different. Um, for instance, there was well, a lot of talk back in the 2016 election. During the uh, uh, primary process, there was a big populist groundswell for Bernie Sanders. Uh, the party uh, establishment, the party elites, were uh, completely behind uh, uh, Hillary Clinton. So there was a big struggle there between the party elite and the popular sentiment. Well, Clinton managed to swing enough popular votes to get the nomination. Well, in, 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 in other democracies, there's no primary election. The party just picks the nominees. So you would think on the surface that would make the parties that much stronger. But in reality, since they have limited access to the candidates, the whole party has to be voted out in order to change the direction of the country. So in the United Kingdom, what we've seen over and over again is you know, conservatives will be in power. I may like my independent uh, member of parliament, my, my MP, but he's a, he's a labor guy or he's a conservative guy, conservatives are in power, conservative prime minister. So what they will ultimately decide is that uh, I may like my conservative member of parliament, okay? But what I don't like is the overall conservative government of the country. So if I want to change the prime minister, I have to vote my MP out even though I like him a good deal. So you don't have a real chance to build on those local constituencies like we do here in the United States. 
So the party is weakened because you can't vote for, uh, you, you know, you have to throw the whole party out of power. So there's a constant struggle between the parties and the local constituencies, and it, it weakens the party overall. Okay, so if you go to the next slide, again, continuing with political parties in other countries, in parliamentary systems, the majority party, and we've talked about this before in class, in parliamentary systems, the majority party in parliament holds the executive power. Remember in parliamentary systems like India, like Thailand, like Canada, like the United Kingdom, uh, uh, like Israel, the majority party, if there is a majority party, elects the executive from the members of parliament. So there are no three branches of government. Executive and legislative power are completely and totally tied. Um, there is one conservative party in the United Kingdom. There is one labor party in the, Demo in the United Kingdom. There is one uh, liberal Democrat party in the United Kingdom. In the United States, there is no one Democratic party. There is no one Republican party. Every state has a Democratic party. The District of Columbia has a Democratic party. There is a National Democratic party. So one way to look at it is there are 52 separate Democratic and Republican parties each state, the District of Columbia, and the National. But if you really want to get into it, each county, and in some cases even small cities, will each have their own Democratic Party. And those little Democratic and Republican parties are in no way accountable legally to the bigger Democratic Party as a whole. So we have things that develop like happened in, in Louisiana in, 19, in the 1980s. Uh, there were two guys that were running for governor. On the Democratic side, it was Edward Edmonds. Edward Edmonds was a former government uh, governor of Louisiana. He had been taken out of office and convicted of a felony and served time in jail. Now, there was no law in Louisiana that prevented Edmund Edmonds, once he got released and got off parole, from running for governor again. The Republican was David Dukes, former imperial wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, a neo-Nazi and a publisher of neo-Nazi uh, 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 documents. Both the Democratic and the Republican Party got tried as hard as they could to get the heck away from that Louisiana gu gubernatorial election. Uh, ultimately, on the upside, uh, that was won by, and again, both state parties, the Republican and the Democratic parties, were in no way obligated to do anything the National Party said because those were both popular within their parties. Uh, those individuals were both popular within their parties. Ultimately, uh, bumper stickers uh, uh, were all over Louisiana that said, uh, vote for the crook, it's important. Uh, they elected Edmund Edwards, uh, uh, Edward Edmonds, the convicted felon. The Ku Klux Klan guy just returned back to the state House of Representatives where he was reelected again. Okay, So in, 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 there is a single party, conservative party, single uh, Labor Party in the United Kingdom, but the disadvantage is that the parties are run by the uh, 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 by the party leadership and not by the individuals. So you just throw out the party leadership, but they wind up taking a lot of party members with them when you kick them out of power. The advantage is in the United Kingdom, elections don't take two years; they take six weeks. Uh, this is Boris Johnson. He is required by law to have a general election every six years. He called a snap general election uh, last summer, uh, the summer of 2019. He called the election on one day and six weeks later in December, so it would have been in the fall. On December 12th, uh, the parties went to the polls, six weeks later. That's the great advantage of having that centralized party system. Okay, let's go to the next slide. U.S. political parties, the founding. Okay. So, and this is where we're going to get into this subject we're going to be talking about for the rest of the day, uh, for the rest of this lecture. Okay, so our founding fathers, when they wrote the Constitution, did not envision political parties being a part of it. In fact, the political, the founding fathers, Jefferson, Madison, Adams, all those guys, actually did not like political parties. So, of course... As soon as George Washington leaves the scene, uh, George Washington was elected by unanimous consent both in the first and second presidential elections. He was considered to be above politics. He did not want to have anything to do with politics other than being president. He was sort of brought in by acclamation. 
But the founding fathers who were so opposed to political parties when they wrote the Constitution of the United States immediately started forming uh, uh, political parties. Uh, Jefferson Davis, who you see, uh, Jefferson Davis, Thomas Jefferson, who you see there in the top picture, uh, founded the Democratic Republican Party. Uh, uh, Jefferson had spent a large, the last several years as a U.S. minister to France. He comes back in 1796. He finishes second in the uh, presidential elections. Uh, back then, finishing second made you the vice president. Uh, while he's the vice president, he forms the Democratic Republican Party. He takes, as you see, the round thing there that's called a rondelle, or in some cases it's called a cockade. Uh, the French revolutionaries, and, and Jefferson was there for the French Revolution, would wear that emblem on their hats to show that they were part of the French Revolution and they were not monarchists. So uh, Jefferson forms the Democratic-Republican Party to be in opposition to the Federalists. Now, the Federalists weren't a, a, a formal political party. They were just a group of people who, who were in opposition to Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson wanted, thought he could use the organization. He put together the Democratic-Republican Party. He picked the name Democratic-Republican to just sort of go over the top with, hey, listen, we're not you know, trying to destroy the Constitution. In fact, we're Democratic-Republicans. We believe in the core basic feelings of the uh, uh, Constitution, but by adopting that French emblem, the emblem of the French Revolution, he's trying to tell people that the problem is if you support the Federalists, <coughs> excuse me, you're supporting a monarchy in the making. And was that true? Did Jefferson believe that? You know, I don't know, but it was good, it was good symbolism. In response, Alexander Hamilton formally form, uh, uh, forms the Federalist Party of the United States. So in 1796, Adams, who's running in this ill-formed Federalist Party, but running as a Federalist, finishes first in the election. He's been the vice president for those first three elections. People just sort of assume that you would, you know, the guy who finished first would be the president. The guy who finished second would be the vice president. That would be elected by the House or confirmed by the House of Representatives. And then you would serve your terms under the president, sort of apprenticing for the job as vice president, and then you would move into the, the role of presidents. Uh, and that worked through the third election. Adams, John, uh, John Adams is elected president as a Federalist. Jefferson finishes his second uh, running with the Democratic-Republican Party. Jefferson serves as vice president. By 1800, the laws have changed, and we have the first party election. Party tickets are formed. Thomas Jefferson is running with Aaron Burr as his vice presidential candidate, period. If you elect Thomas Jefferson, you are also electing Aaron Burr as vice president. And so in the 1800, the first party tickets were formed, and Thomas Jefferson goes in and, and finishes first, and Aaron Burr becomes his vice president. Okay, let's go to the next slide. U.S. political parties, the founding. Uh, the Federalist Party, we've already discussed this. Uh, the Federalists in New England uh, sent a secret message, to, uh, tried to send a secret message to the British saying that they would leave the Union if uh, Britain would settle a separate peace with them. Uh, unfortunately, they sent it too late, and the Treaty of Ghent had already been signed. The War of 1812 was over. The letter became public, and the Federalist Party just collapses and disappears. Republicans won seven presidential, the Democratic Republicans won seven presidential elections in a row. And held the house in the White House until 1824. With one party so dominant, the idea of having political parties almost went by the wayside. Um, parties were more about forming policies and a, a more of a debating society among the voting elite, rather than getting the vote out. Similar to the British system that they had recently left, the, the candidates were picked by the party. There was no real sort of groundswell of support. Uh, the picture here is that's John Quincy Adams, the son of John Adams. John Adams, not reading the political uh, 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 signs at the time, was thrown out of office roundly by Thomas Jefferson in 1800. The same thing would happen to his son, John Quincy Adams. He's a one-term president, and he completely misread what was going on. He was elected in, not in 1924, like it says on the next slide, but John Quincy Adams comes in in the election of 1824, Andrew Jackson wins both the popular vote and the electoral vote, 
but the parties are split. The, 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 the Democratic Republican Party is beginning to fall apart. Uh, but they've got enough power in the House of Representatives that even though Andrew Jackson wins in the popular vote and the electoral vote, he doesn't get that 50% majority, so he gets thrown into the House of Representatives. And the House puts John Quincy Adams in as President of the United States, and, Ad and Jackson is furious. He is beside himself. He is so angry. What he sees happening at that time was in the next four years, certain key things are going to happen. In 1820, voter eligibility explodes. The opportunity for white men to register to vote just expands by, as you can see, over 300%. In 1820, 1824, 360,000 uh, 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 men were eligible to vote. In 1828, over a million were eligible to vote. And remember, we are still talking about white men here. Uh, the Electoral College delegates were no longer appointed by state governments or elected by the state House of Representatives or the state Senate. Electoral College delegates would be elected by the uh, voters in 1828. And then parties began to grow from the bottom up, led by uh, local organizers. Jackson sees this happening. And so he splits away from the Democratic Republican Party and forms the Democratic Party and runs as a Democrat. Uh, let's go to the next side. Again, it says U.S. Poly uh, political parties of the Jacksonian. Jackson forms what we now understand as a modern political party. Uh, his model of the Democratic Party, uh, even though there's been a lot of changes within the Democratic Party, would be the model that we still carry on with today to a great extent is what a political party should look like. First of all, he used the party to administer the spoil systems. Now, if you remember, we talked about the spoil system. We talked about, you know, it ended with the Pendleton Act. But at this time, the party administered the spoil system. So when a local postmaster job would come up, the local uh, 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 dominant party in that area would go to their elected senator and say, hey, listen, we got a guy here. He worked hard on the campaign. Could you talk to the president and get this guy appointed attorney postmaster uh, for this town? Hey, listen, we need a new customs inspector. This guy worked on the campaign. And they would send their recommendations up through the chain to the president, and then that appointment would come back down through the party. The party did not rely on a big national think tank sort of thing like the old Federalists and the old Democratic Republicans did, where they had a, uh, you know, the party leadership ran the party. The party in his, in Jackson's Democratic Party relied on local party administrators at the local level, uh, where cities, towns, counties, states would be where the force of, and the weight of the party would come from. And the job became not just to convince people, but to mobilize people. And yeah, a lot of times that mobilization took the form of bribes. There was a long-standing joke that, you know, in, in, in certain states where prohibition was enforced long before it was enforced nationally, you know, come vote for us and we'll give you a bottle of whiskey. Uh, come vote for us and we'll give you $5, which at that time was a lot of money. Some of these things would later become incredibly illegal. But that local party administrators were responsible for getting out the vote. And the more votes you got out, the heavier you got to dip into the spoil system. But ultimately, Jackson believed in the populist system. He believed that getting the mass of people together was how you won elections. Um, and the, the thing you see here is uh, 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 the top picture. Well, what these people are hacking at with knives is a block of cheddar cheese. And this became a very famous uh, thing. In 1836, uh, there was a big expo in uh, uh, Sandy Creek, New York. Uh, and one of the local residents, uh, and they were, for some reason, they thought a great way to celebrate some anniversary of the, the Revolutionary War was to build big, huge blocks of cheese. And so uh, this block of cheese that you see them cutting on was sent to uh, the President of the United States after the expo. It was four feet across and two feet thick. It weighed 1,400 pounds, and it was a very sharp, very strong cheddar cheese. <clears throat> well, it sat in a room in the White House for about a year and a half. And then in 1837, Jackson begins to realize that if he doesn't do something with his cheese, 
He's got to take it home with him. He's got to ship it back to Tennessee. And shipping a 1,400-pound block of cheese, it was nobody's idea of a good time. So what he does is he, on a, a specific Wednesday, throws open the doors of the White House for anyone to come in and, and have a chunk of this cheese. And you would think 1,400 pounds, that's going to take a while. 10,000 people came into the White House to get some of President Jackson's cheese. This was, it sounds as dumb as this sounds to us today, this was just exactly what the people wanted from uh, President Jackson. They wanted him to be down to earth. They wanted him to be homey. They wanted him to be one of the masses. Uh, and we can see this idea coming through American politics over and over again. Uh, you know, we saw it with, uh, you know, to a certain extent with, uh, uh, well, we saw it with Al Gore, who was Harvard educated and went to the best private schools, but he had that, would put on that down home persona when he was back in Tennessee. We saw it to a certain extent with Barack Obama, who was, again, Harvard educated, uh, but could put on, uh, could take on that mantle of being the everyman. And we certainly see it with uh, uh, Donald Trump whose you know, father gave him $125 million to start his business, and yet he tries to portray himself as an everyday Joe. Well, the 10,000 people came in to get the president's cheese. It was gone in two hours, uh, but it just made him incredibly popular, uh, and the people loved Tom, uh, uh, Jackson for that sort of thing. So there began to be a need for an opposition party. Again, we see mature democracies always sorting out into political parties. The opposition comes in the form of the Whig Party, which was founded in 1833. And they took the name from the old British anti-royalist uh, uh, political party. Uh, now, again, Jefferson took the, the symbols and, and, and the air of the French Revolution that opposed the monarchy. Uh, the Whig Party takes this anti-royalist establishment name to sort of say, hey, listen, President Jackson is becoming a king and we, we have to stop him. Uh, the Whigs assume that the Democrats will collapse as soon as uh, Jackson leaves office. They were wrong. They did not. Uh, but in 1841, uh, uh, William Henry Harrison becomes president. Uh, under the Whig Party, that's William Henry Harrison there. At the bottom, we remember William Henry Harrison for one thing, and that was, say it together, he died. He died in office. He was the first president to die in office and prove that the order of succession will work. Uh, from, 18, uh, from 1840 until 1860, those five presidential elections, they switched back between the Democrats and the Whigs every election. The nation is in such turmoil, principally over slavery, that it is impossible for a single president to hold two terms. It's back and forth between the Whigs and the Democrats. And that holds true until the election of 1860. Let's go to the next slide. U.S. political parties, the Civil War. Uh, in the mid-1850s, unable to form a platform that really grapples with the uh, economy, which, again, we've already discussed this. In the 1850s, the economy is shifting over from an agrarian base, we're beginning to see that first real explosion of industrial complexes across the United States, and also the driving political issue of the 1850s, slavery. The Whigs cannot come up with a con coherent policy on either of those, and the Whigs just disintegrate, collapse, disappear as a party. The Democratic Party splits over slavery and forms the Southern Democratic Party and the Democratic Party. Uh, the Democratic Party was, the northern branch of the Democratic Party was pro-abolition of slavery, um, and the Southern Democratic Party was anti, uh, was pro-slavery. Uh, but on all economic issues and on everything other than uh, 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 slavery, they were relatively similar, but it splits the vote across the north. Now, the Republicans nominate Abraham Lincoln. Now, contrary to popular belief, before 1860, before the South, Southern states started leaving uh, the Union, Lincoln was fairly moderate with no strong position on slavery. In fact, the Republican Party promised, their platform said, <coughs> that we will not interfere in the institution of slavery where it already exists. 
their statement was that we are just not going to let it expand into the other territories where it does not already exist, which was a fairly moderate position. Um, but in, but the, the, all the, the Southern Democrats uh, and most Southerners heard was, if they don't let us expand slavery, remember the compromise that we will admit one slave state at the same time we admit a free state, so that the balance in the Senate would always be 50-50. Um, what the Southern states hear is, they're not going to allow us to expand as they expand free states and admit more free states. They're not going to allow any more slave states. So the balance in the Senate will shift inevitably over to free states, to abolition. And so southern states said if, if the Republicans are elected, if Lincoln's elected to the presidency, we're going to secede from the Union. Lincoln's name didn't even appear on the ballot in most southern states. Um, he wins 40% of the popular vote. The uh, other uh, votes are split between the, uh, the, the Southern Democrats, the Democrats, and what was called the National Union Party, which had very little impact on national history, so don't worry about them. But by splitting it uh, all three ways, uh, splitting it principally three ways, Lincoln gets enough votes out of the Northern electoral votes out of the Northern uh, states that he becomes the 16th president of the United States in the 1860s. The... Uh, uh, the part the, the the union disintegrates. The Civil War is fought. Uh, go to the next slide. Um, and after the war, th there's a split. Former Union states become Republican. Confe former Confederate states tend to be Democrats. Sure, there are a couple of exceptions here or there. Uh, the 1952 election, when General Eisenhower becomes president, was a clear example where a lot of Republicans got swept into power in the South, and then immediately voted back out four years later. But with this dichotomy where northern states are hardcore uh, 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 Republicans for the most case, southern states are hardcore uh, Democrats, there began this, uh, the, the machines began to take power. And a machine is a political party that through the spoil systems runs and manages everything within uh, uh, that district or that state. Uh, in the state of New York, uh, from the 1850s to the 1930s, it was called Tammany Hall, uh, the Tammany Hall machine. And you see the guy who ran the Tammany Hall machine, William Tweed. Nobody ever called him William Tweed. He was just boss, Boss Tweed. And he was called Boss Tweed because he literally ran the state of New York. Um, and he ran the state of New York. He relied heavily. He, the, the, the Tammany Hall machine went out in the 1850s and worked very hard to get the recent Irish immigrants registered. And so, and get them to vote. So when the spoil systems came down and it came time to hire new policemen, new firefighters, uh, the, the New York City Police Department was referred to in various uh, uh, it, slightly defamatory terms as an Irish police department because Boss Tweed made sure that to pay the Irish back for their votes, he would give them all police jobs, firefighter jobs. Uh, that wasn't just a normal thing. It also happened in uh, in the South. Uh, Frank Dixon here was a lawyer in Birmingham who was never elected to public office, and yet he ran the state because he was a lawyer for what were called the Big Mules. Uh, Alabama, from the end of the Civil War until the 1950s, 1960s, some people will even say in the 1970s, had two basic industries, cotton and steel and coal. Uh, so 12 families ran the, the, the state, and they were known as the big mules. They had to have, for coal mining and for um, agriculture, they had to have cheap access to labor. They had to have fairly lenient rules concerning industrial pollution and industrial safety. Uh, and Frank Dixon was one of those guys who brokered the deals that kept the big mules in power in Alabama for most of the 20th century. Uh, it wasn't until the 1950s when a guy named Big Jim Folsom uh, got elected governor, one of the most colorful characters uh, in, in American political history. Uh, he fought against the big mules, but then again, when, when he left office and George Wallace came into power, uh, the big mules would again, George Wallace relied heavily on what was left of the big mule infrastructure to keep him as governor of the state, basically from 1960 well into the 1980s. 
Um, but on the national level, Republicans were the dominant political party because there were more Republic people living in Republican states than there were living in Southern states. So again, you see this dichotomy between local parties being run by these machines and the national party being run uh, uh, on a national level uh, without that sort of support. Now, in the 1930s, we begin to see reform, and my dog is standing outside the door, banging on the door. That's, that's why I'm laughing. Okay. In the 1930s, we enter into what's called a re the reform era. There's a pushback against party bosses, against one-party rule in many states. Uh, we begin to tighten voter registration to prevent fraud. There used to be a motto, hey, in Chicago, you vote early and you vote often. Um, you know, people would come in and, and one time they did an examination of the people who had voted uh, in, 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 in Chicago in one election and they found out 3,500 people that voted were dead and buried in Chicago. Um, national parties began to shift away from party affiliation uh, and shift more and focus on the candidate themselves. Uh, when Roosevelt was running, a lot of Democrats would vote, well, a lot of Republicans would vote for Roosevelt. Uh, even though he was a Democrat, because they believed in him personally. Uh, you see here uh, the two people pictured. Uh, that's President Truman on the left, President Eisenhower on the right. Uh, President Eisenhower was courted actually by both the Democrats and the Republicans for the 1952 election. Uh, he could have gone either way. He chose the Republicans not for any particular uh, uh, you know, doctrinal reason, but because growing up in Kansas... Kansas had been a Republican state, and his family had always been Republican, so he went with Republicans, but it would have been <coughs> up to him who he chose to run, uh, uh, what party he chose to run with. Uh, the big driving factor, again, just like 100 years earlier, the driving factor that begins to deal with, with a big, huge break in the party is going to be the issue of race. Uh, and after Roosevelt, Roosevelt dealt with race when he absolutely had to. Uh, Roosevelt had other, you know, you know, fixing race relations in the United States was not on President Roosevelt's priority list. He had to fix the Depression. He had to win World War II. He would deal with race when he had to, and he dealt with it effectively when it came up. But he was not out there to change race relations. Harry Truman was the same way. Uh, in, in 1947, when he... He got the uh, uh, National Security Act, National Defense Act passed. Uh, he included in that that the armed forces of the United States would be desegregated. You would no longer have uh, uh, what were then known as colored and white units. They would desegregate the armed forces. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Uh, and, Rosa, and, and Eisenhower had no desire to get involved in race relations. Absolutely none. You know, told, and we've talked about it, how he told uh, Chief Justice Warren when he nominated him uh, to be Chief Justice that he didn't want to deal with the race issue. He didn't want Warren to deal with the race issue. Uh, and then they, and Warren immediately turns around and authors the opinion on, on, on Brown v. Board of Education. Uh, Eisenhower did send troops to Little Rock to desegregate the 101st Airborne Division, to Little Rock to desegregate the schools there. But again, presidents only dealt with race when they absolutely had to. And None of that had any impact on the South, at least in political parties, because remember at this time, until 1964, 1965 when the Voters' Right Act is, or Voters right Act is passed, and Lyndon Johnson signs that executive order saying the full weight of the federal government will enforce those laws. Voter rolls in, in the South were still incredibly white, they were incredibly democratic, They were, and, and, and until that changed, nothing was going to change. So... We then go, go to the next slide where it says U.S. political parties polarization. Uh, and, and, um, so in, 19, in, the, in the late 1940s, uh, President Truman forms a commission on uh, uh, civil rights. He also integrates the armed forces. That's all, and he's a Democrat. That's all that the Democrats can stand. Uh, in 1948, Southern Democrats formed what was called the Dixiecrat Party. Uh, the nominee of the Dixie, and this was an ardent, out, outwardly, uh, 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 demonstratively racist party that demanded the continuation of segregations in schools, demanded continuations of the poll tax, could demanded continuation of uh, literacy tests, all those Jim Crow laws 
that had kept uh, uh, blacks off the voter rolls in the South for a hundred years. The Dixiecrat Party was all behind it. And the nominee of the Dixiecrat Party was then the governor of South Carolina, Strom Thurmond. Um, you know, if you want to, you can go back and you can Google Strom Thurmond speeches. I can't, I won't show them in class. Because they are tremendously racist. And even at that, the Dixiecrats carried South Carolina, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana in that election. Uh, 1948, the election goes for Truman. 1952, uh, the Republicans take power. But uh, the Republican, while the Democratic Party is splitting on civil rights, the Republican Party is splitting into a financial wing that is only really cares about what's the best economic policy for the country, and <clears throat> what we know now as the social conservative wing of the party that are looking at things like abortion, prayer in schools, uh, you know, divorce laws, and things like that, you know, homosexual rights, transgender rights, that social conservative wing of the uh, uh, conservative party. So the Democratic Party support nationwide for the civil rights movement forces the race issue in the South. And in 1968, Richard Nixon sees this and comes up with a Southern strategy where he will try to blend that social conservative wing of the Republican Party along with these disaffected whites in the Democratic Party in the South to build a national coalition strong enough to carry the Electoral College in 1968. And it wins in 1968. It wins for Nixon in 1972. Nixon gets thrown out of party, out of out of uh, uh, the office. Uh, Jimmy Carter wins in 1976. 1980, Ronald Reagan comes back with the exact same Southern strategy that Nixon used. He wins by a by the biggest electoral landslide in history in 1980. Wins again by a massive electoral landslide in 1984. Carries Bush across the line in 1988, and this Southern strategy gets used so often from '68 all the way to uh, President Clinton getting uh, elected in 1992, uh, that the South swings Republican uh, for the first time ever. Uh, well, first time since the war. So uh, going to the next slide, uh, we continue the polarization process. Uh, by the 1980, the, the South has swung Republican. Uh, and in order to keep the South in the Republican Party and keep them voting Republican, the Republican Party has to swing further and further to the white right, further and further embracing that social conservative wing of the party. Uh, you know, President Trump, who has so fully embraced the social conservative wing of the party, has completely thrown those financial conservatives out of the party, and they are now the party of social conservatism. Blacks who had traditionally been Republicans since the the end of the uh, since they were given the right to vote shift immediately to the Democratic Party. The shift is literally overnight. In 1968, when they see Nixon going into the South and completely abdicating the Republican Party's uh, uh, advocacy of civil rights, blacks immediately shift over to the Democratic Party. The two main parties have become increasingly polarized, allowing the resurgence of the party and the importance of the party elite. And yeah, now you're seeing bosses again. And we got the two big bosses right here, Nancy Pelosi uh, and Donald Trump. And you can see this is from their last, the last State of the Union address, where Nancy Pelosi was so infuriated by the president's speech at the end, she tore up the, the text of his speech. Uh, uh, in 2008 uh, the, is when that shift change goes, where the, the fiscal conservatives are cast out of the Republican Party and the Tea Party movement takes over. And then in 2016, the, the, the very uh, part Republican Party is redefined by Donald Trump. There is no longer a financial conservative base in the party. Nobody's trying to manage the federal budget. They are all just going for social conservative issues. Uh, 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 gays serving in the military, transgender serving in the military, protection of transgender rights. Uh, uh, selecting uh, Supreme Court justices based solely on their stance on Roe v. Wade, which we discussed last time, was the, uh, whether or not a woman has a right to choose when to terminate her pregnancy. And that's really where we're at today. And there's not a, you know, where we're going to go after this, you know, is up for grabs in anybody's guess. Clearly, uh, the Trumpists have taken over the Republican Party and they've solidified their control over the uh, Republican Party. 
to the point where if you are perceived as saying or doing anything against President Trump, your uh, opportunity, your chances of continuing in the party basically go down to zero. Uh, the Democrats are becoming more, uh, are being uh, driving a more liberal agenda. Um, right now, with COVID-19, everything is kind of up in the air. Where this will go, we've got a national election coming up in, uh, in 2020. Um, and again, you know, it's the nature of the political parties. Uh, we currently have, uh, you know, the three people who have got a reasonable shot at being the next president of the United States, uh, Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, and Donald Trump, all 70-year-old white dudes. I mean, there's just no two ways about it. That's where our political system uh, has come to. Now, we're going to talk a lot more about political parties next time. I would tell you and I would challenge you that right now you need to be the people that are out there looking at what it's going to take uh, to revitalize these parties and drive them in the direction that you, you want to see. You'll be registering, you know, for to vote in, in, the, in the next two years. Uh, you know, make those political parties do what you want. Okay, all right. So that's 45 minutes. We will reconvene later on this week uh, to have a conversation about uh, more about political parties, part two of political parties. Very exciting. It's the conclusion of the mini series. Uh, you'll enjoy it. it it'll, it'll make you cry. It'll make you laugh. Uh, it'll be wonderful. Okay. Uh, stay safe. Stay well. Uh, uh, please, uh, you know, uh, observe all the requirements that are being put on you now so you can stay safe uh, and stay well and we can see you again. All right. Take care uh, and we will see you again later on this week.